go on. I call it language of the landscape. I use this quote by Terry Tempest Williams where she says, when Leopold speaks of silphium, sedge, leatherleaf, tamarack, buffalo, bluebirds, cranes, geese, deer, uh, geese, deer, and wolves, he recognizes them as family. His language of landscape evokes an intimacy born of experience. She then goes on to write, the relationship between language and landscape is a marriage of sound and form. Is that the same thing? No, no it's well, not. Because I can't, yeah, but then I'm in front of these people. Each of us belongs to a particular landscape, one that informs who we are and a place that, can you forget? A place that carries our history, our dreams, holds us to a moral line of behavior that transcends thought. And she also says that the relationship between language and landscape is a marriage of sound and form. It is an oral geography, a sensual topography that draws us to a place and keeps us there. Where we live is at the center of how we speak. I'm a resident of the Corn Belt. My language consists of concerns about rain, too much, the lack of, how high the corn is, and the price of that corn. But for those of us who want to know more, we try to learn our prairie heritage. The words blue stem, dock, blazing star, and the myriads of prairie inhabitants punctuate our language. At least we forget our roots. The words of the prairie pioneers should never be forgotten and are found sprinkled in our writing. So what is a language of the landscape and how do you learn it? Can you buy a CD and put it in your car like you can, you know, Spanish or French? Uh, these are some of the steps that I've used for the language of the landscape. First of all, I choose a landscape or a place I would like to visit. And for our example today, I'm going to choose Utah. Once I've chosen a place, I read a lot about it, I research it. And for this trip, Michael read a lot of Edward Abbey and you've noticed a lot of those quotes have punctuated um, the classes. I've read books by Terry Tempest Williams and I'll put this on the reference. One I really liked was the book called Red. I then choose some words that might describe this place. So for example, for this trip, we had Raven, Mesa, Pinion, Canyon, Butte, Sandstone, Mormon, Sage, Arch, Finn, Petroglyph. Each of these words every day, the words are all in a bag. I have them here in this little envelope. And you put them in a bag and each day one lucky person gets to draw that word. And that is your word of the day. That is your word for journaling. You have to use it in some way. I then, we also choose some wish I had said that phrases, so when we're journaling, we might use one of those phrases that might become, but one of the wish I had said that phrases might become a springboard for a drawing or something. A lot of times I like to look at the local papers to see if there's something going on. Uh, when we were in Utah or in Colorado, they talked about the deer, and so it was the deer bugling. So I cut that out and put it in my book next to a little excerpt that I call the bugle. <coughs> so, as an example, this is what we have from our journal. I believe these are on October 17th. And the word of the day was sandstone. And Michael wrote, sandstone. Experience the sandstone in all its forms as sand eroded from everywhere and ground to a fine powder under thousands of feet as cliffs that tower vertically for thousands of feet and no, oh, and no thought of erosion, as water eroded clefts called slot canyons, sinuous and grooved, glowing with internal light, and finally as hanging gardens moist with 3,000 year old water and home to plants that really shouldn't be there. I wrote, and Trotta, Wingate, Navajo, Red, orange, white, mountains, 
mesas, buttes, fins, arches, pinnacles, water carved, wind swept, eroded, slick rock, cross bedding, desert varnish, slot canyons, weeping walls, waterfalls, arches, Bryce Zion, the sedimentary rock of the Colorado Plateau. One thing you'll notice about both of those is it was the same word, but they were totally different thoughts. We had totally different views. And the one thing that when we talk about when we do these on trips is you must share. We've used, this, we've used language of the landscape with our nieces, um, and they always are like, oh, Aunt Sue, I can't do the dishes. I can't help with this. I have to do my homework. And then, then they always are after us to share. We've done them on our bird trips with our friends, and it just seems to work really well. And it just, you come home, and most of your journaling is done. And as Terry Tempest Williams wrote in red, why do we do this? She says, I want to write my way from the margins to the center. I want to speak the language of the grasses, rooted yet soft and supple in the presence of the wind before a storm. I want to write in the form of migrating geese, like an arrow pointing south toward a direction of safety. I want to keep my words wild so that even if the land and everything we hold dear is destroyed by short-sightedness and greed, there is a record of beauty and passionate participation by those who saw what was coming. So you are the people that are going to be documenting Amaquan, and you're the ones that see what's coming.
dolomite colored tympanum, and frequent but abundant insects. Circling trees, cycle of 17, an aggregation of noise, <coughs> light at its loudest. Clusters of cast skins, immature insects crawl to light from dime sized holes. That was an observation from my notebook. Above the ground, oh so short, days above, years below, an abundant buzzing arthropod. Most, you know, were, you know, the red eyes, the dolomite tympanum, these were all things I observed. A couple things I had to go to a field guide, but here's my factual poem about the periodic cicada. I find these to be quite addictive, and I like to do them. Uh, when I was at Arches, I came up with this one. This one is also not only an acrostic, but a shape poem as well. Awesome architecture, raucous ravens, cinnamon colored, tumbling heights, echoing eons, sandstone solitude. This is one from one of the members of our class. They did one on, uh, they sketched Ubalaria, which is bell, uh, bellwort, and then they also did the acrostic about it. And then we have an overachiever in our Allerton group. <laughs> she not only did it this way, but she also was able to get the in to work as well. And she recently turned in one where she also has then like a middle sentence. So it does this wonderful, it's almost like she's doing, it's almost two poems or two things in one. Um, Allerton Park liked her acrostic so much that they are using it in their fundraising brochure. So she's, uh, like I said, she's an overachiever. <laughs> now you might be wondering what you're going to be doing. I have these little homework cards. Um, you want to pass half of them out? Pass the other half, or I can. Each of them, if you look at the card, it's going to have an organism. And then you've got a ticket with a word. Remember that word that you all came up with? That's your language of the landscape word. So you've got your organism that I want you to write about, do an acrostic. And then the ticket is your, I want you to use for your language of landscape. What are you supposed to do with the organism? Huh? Thank you. Sketch it? Oh, also sketch it. It's also in your I mean also sketch it. Yes. <laughs> you were supposed to write an acrostic about it uh -huh. and using it. Right. And so, sketch it. Uh, right. And then your uh, words for language in the landscape or your observations for next time you can ticket. So your word ticket, does everybody have one? Yes. 
And the word on the ticket is a journal entry up with the using that word. Yes. Okay, I guess I do hear. <laughs> Good job. Good job, everybody. Now that I've totally confused you, I need to talk about how Helen Hagen is There you go. What is your word? That's a great word. I thought maybe you had the word sauger. I love that word. Who has sauger? Sauger. I got I got a 20 inch sauger. Thanks, Because I don't even know what a sauger is as an etymologist. It's a Okay, another quote from Pete Dune. I really like what Pete has to say. He says, strange to say, I cannot recall the color of those eyes. He was talking about Roger Tory Peterson. But if described on some color chart in a paint store, no nonsense cool would not be inappropriate. We've been talking, especially last week, or the last gathering, Michael kept talking about the give and take, give and take of photography. Depth of field, shutter speed. Well, it's a lot like that.